Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hotcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by Go Iowa Awesome and Rivals.com. I'm a recruiting analyst, men's basketball beat writer, football beat writer, and more at Iowa.Rivals.com. Um, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by publisher Adam Jacoby and managing editor Ross Binder, who help out on all those beats and handle uh, so many different things for us at iowa.rivals.com. Before we get started, make sure that you subscribe. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, watching on YouTube, hit that like button, drop a comment. And if you're watching or listening, rather, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, hit that subscribe button. You might be listening, but not subscribed. So make sure you do that so you don't miss an episode. Jan Jensen making her debut as the Iowa women's... Me- I always said, oh my gosh. Iowa women's basketball head coach. I almost said Iowa women's men's head basketball coach. Uh, That'd be quite the promotion. What'd you say? (laughs) That'd be quite the promotion. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Fran might have something to say about Fran might have something to say about that. But uh, anyway, the uh, newest women's head basketball coach following the retirement of Lisa Bluter. Of course, we talked about that a little bit on our last pod, which you can go back and listen to, but Adam, you were there today. Um, what are some of the things that that stuck out the most from from uh, Jensen's presser this this afternoon? Well, in in terms of a a, a quote new head coach, uh, Jan Jensen was obviously as familiar as as any really could be here in Iowa City. Uh, but for somebody who needs no introduction, she spent about 40, 45 minutes at her introductory press conference just answering questions to the fullest extent, which is really the only way that she knows how. And uh, I I thought, honestly, that she was very impressive. Um, Not a surprise in the slightest, but uh, she, you know, really exuded a lot of her typical enthusiasm for the job, uh, mentioned that it was her dream job, uh, and, and really working at Iowa had always been her dream job, and now she had her dream job title. And we, we can go into the uh, the details of um, her staying in Iowa City over the last uh, 24 years. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the specifics on that for a little bit. But, you know, it, it really was clear from this introduction, from the opening statements and then the uh, sidebar afterwards with Beth Getz that, uh, you know, Coach J, as she's uh, quite affectionately called, was indeed the, the best choice, the easy choice. And uh, as Caitlin Clark said, the only choice to uh, step in for uh, Coach Bluter. So uh, really an impressive performance, but but also not anything that was surprising or even remotely out of the ordinary for uh, Jan Jensen. She was herself, uh, as she always is, and um, really stood out as a great communicator and a, a, a great real ambassador for the university. Uh, did either of you guys uh, get the chance to watch it on YouTube? I I watched it. Um, I, I think the overarching thing uh, from, from Jan this, this afternoon is, is all the things you said. I mean, she is who she is. She's unapo- unapologetically herself. And that is what attracts so many people to her. Um, she, she mentioned the positivity. She mentioned the, um, the, the loyalty aspect. I think the loyalty thing, I want to hit that first before we talk too much about like the on court stuff, recruiting, anything like that. But, um, she mentioned, I think today that she said she had double digit opportunities to be a head coach somewhere. And she decided about eight years ago that Iowa is where she wanted to be. And I think, that I, I just thought that was really impressive. I think it's really indicative as to what Lisa Bluter has built at Iowa, but also who Jan Jensen is and who Iowa's getting as their next head coach of women's basketball. Um, I just thought that was really cool. And, and the fact that she had all those opportunities is just another indication of how good of a coach she is and what she's been able to do at Iowa. Uh, so I, I just thought that I think I saw it on Twitter because I watched a, a replay of it. I wasn't able to watch it live because the the Sadu Traor commitment. Um, but I, I saw a tweet. I was like, you know that that thing in old cartoons where the eyes pop out of their head. <laughs> it was kind of like that. Um, I, I would have expected like maybe four or five 
but to say double digits was was pretty impressive. Yeah, that part I was a little bit surprised that she went into that much detail. And and she even went ahead and said that there were two or three different instances where she thought, you know, maybe I really do want to take this um, this opportunity. Uh, but yeah, she did mention double digits. And I think she, her perception of a lot of those, of most of those, were that they weren't terribly serious or, or that there was, uh, her word was strategic. And she she likened it to recruiting somebody that you don't think is going to commit. And, and so you sort of shift the way that you approach opportunities like those. And, and so I think some of them were just sort of instances where somebody's checking a box. Somebody is saying, well, we talked to this person. Oh, we think this person's impressive, but it's really not, you know, a, a, a two way fit. But, yeah, I that was notable that she mentioned the the double digit aspect to it and she also mentioned elliot like you brought up that about eight years ago uh and and i i wanted to make sure that um i got this right so i did double check it with the university but she said you know about eight years ago she decided that it, uh, that she was just going to remain associate head coach at iowa and essentially wait for the iowa job to show up now that being said it was not a foregone conclusion that she would get this. And that is not only from coach Jay, but from Beth gets um, both at the beginning and in the sidebar afterward, I, I even asked, you know, if they had secured the uh, waiver for posting the job um, prior to the um, retirement by Bluter, like, like if that was a thing that was already in place for this moment and and she was adamant and saying you know no this was you know we we figured out pretty quick that jensen was who we wanted and so we went through that process afterwards but you know to me that just makes the uh timing and execution of this uh even more impressive and uh and one more thing elliot you you mentioned the loyalty and i i think i kind of buried the lead here because that loyalty has gone both ways and and jensen said essentially that uh, the staff is going to be coming back. Uh, all the players have said that they're going to be coming back. All the recruits are still committed. Uh, so she called that a big day one win for her. And yeah, no kidding. Uh, but it also really just sort of speaks to the uh, involvement that she's had in this program over the last 20, 24 years and, and the strength of the relationships that she built uh, with every coach, every recruit, every player, to the extent that when they hear this news, for as much of a shock as it is to all of them, they can be like, yeah, but I'm still in. Yeah, I, I think it was, it's just loyalty on loyalty. And again, like I said, this just repeatedly goes back to Coach Bluter and to Coach Jensen, right? Um, I, I think it's just really indicative of what they've built at Iowa, the culture that they've maintained. Um, and what did what did Jan say this afternoon? Culture doesn't graduate. Um, I, I thought that was probably the quote of the presser. Um, the the other thing I, I wanted to hit on regarding this is some of the things that Jan is going to bring to the program that might not have been there prior to with Lisa, because there's definitely going to be differences, right? I mean, as, as much a continuity as I was going to have between having these two separate women be the head coaches of the program. There were a couple things. I, I can't remember who asked it. It might've been Chad Lystico, Um, but she mentioned like the possibility of a full court press. I thought that was really interesting. Was it Raina who brought that up to her? She had she had credited Raina for the idea, and uh, okay. and Raina was the only one that wasn't present at the press conference. But uh, she, uh, uh, Jan mentioned multiple times that Raina had been on a scheduled vacation, so uh, clearly not a whole lot to read into her absence. I would say there, and uh, it, it, which is you know sort of notable in and of itself because Raina is somebody that had been talked about and and, and had entered that program for future head coaches. And I know that that is still the goal for her and, and really the um, program's vision for her, you know, whether it's a future head coach at Iowa way down the road or somewhere else, you know, she wouldn't be the first person to uh, be part of the Lisa Bluter coaching tree to, to you know, be a D1 head coach. So, um, you know, that 
uh, to, to actually answer your question, yeah, she had she had come up with that. And I know there was a lot of Iowa fans who heard that quote about installing a full core press, and they're like, oh, uh, because that's exciting. That's fun. And uh, and Jan also did, you know, mention shortly thereafter that what she's really interested in most is offense. And, you know, I mean, check the tape. <laughs> check any Iowa game over the last 10 years for, for proof of that. So, you know, those fingerprints are going to stay the same. Iowa's still going to play exciting, up-tempo basketball. And if they decide to go, you know, um, press Virginia, uh, you know, there's a pretty darn good proof of concept of that in the uh, second round game at uh, Carver Hawkeye just a couple months ago. Ross, I know you, you uh, read and edited Adam's article. Is there anything that, that stuck out to you in terms of uh, takeaways from the presser? I was just going to say to Adam, you know, if you mention full court press to an Iowa fan, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Dr. Tom, right? I mean, that's the obvious the go to Dr. Tom Davis with the Iowa men. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that would be an interesting change, I think, for the program if they adapted some some full court press. Uh, you know, I think what stood out to me um, was some of the things you guys the things you guys have already hit on in terms of, you know, Jensen betting on herself um, to stay at Iowa and wait for uh, the Iowa job to come open with no idea of, you know, when that might be because uh, Bluter was not, you know, broadcasting that, you know, oh, I'm, I'm wrapping up here in a year or two, or, oh, I'm, you know, the, the end is coming. Like it, it was very abrupt for, for everybody um, as, as has been made pretty clear over the last couple of days with her comments and, and the comments of Beth Getz and, and Jan Jensen. Um, so, yeah, I think just that betting on herself is, is very uh, interesting and it obviously paid off in a big way. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's it's interesting to see just the combination of both, you know, incredible stability. And, you know, this is one of the most seamless transitions, I think, uh, Iowa could have made just in terms of, you know, promoting Jensen, maintaining that culture, maintaining the staff, uh, the roster, the recruits. Uh, but also, you know, she's not Lisa Bluter. Like, she has her own ideas about coaching basketball and and running an offense and running a defense and, and all these things. So, you know, I think that is, and how that manifests itself, I think will be really interesting. Like, you know, the, the last, last few years, Bluter ball has been, you know, it's been tremendous, uh, no doubt. Um, but, you know, there's always, always room for improvement. There's always ways things can be different. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how those differences uh, become apparent under Jensen. The other thing that I kind of noticed today is that she was, I, obviously she was around for so much success at Iowa. She recognized the fact that they're going to be a different team next year and kind of tampered expectations while also saying the goal every year is to win the Big Ten Conference tournament or, or just the regular season title and, and go and win a bunch of games in the tournament. Right. But at the same time, she recognized like you don't have the goat anymore. Right. <laughs> like things are going to be different, yeah. you know, and, and she recognized that while also saying we're still going to go out and win a bunch of games. Right. Yeah. And, and a big part of that is just sort of, it's, it's pretty antithetical to a whole lot of coaches, but especially a coach like Jensen, uh, she said that she she never wants to go into a season thinking, you know, oh, let's go out there and let, let's make it to fifth place. That if you're on that court, you're competing and, and you're trying to win. And the fact that, you know, I mean, yeah, Caitlin Clark left. And so the realistic expectations, the, the expectations that, you know, folks like us can talk about, um, those are going to have to be a little bit tamped down. Like I, I think in ESPN's most recent top 25, like the way too early top 25s, I think Iowa is not ranked. I think uh, the the last bracketology that I saw from Charlie Cream uh, had Iowa as like an eight seed, right? So like just on the precipice, but on the wrong side of the top 25. And that seems a little bit fair. You know, at the same time, Caitlin, you know, is leaving with, a pretty substantial senior class 
Uh, but uh, Hannah Stulkey's back. Lucy Olson is coming to town, and and uh, you know they. Uh, uh, Coach Jay mentioned that her second call, um, you know, after you know informing folks that she was <laughs> that that uh, Bluter was retiring, uh, but the the call she made after that was to Lucy, and and just to you know one break the bad news, but but to really sort of get on the same page, and she said that that was uh, tough but gratifying, and they were you know they were rolling. Uh, I believe was her word uh, by the end of the conversation. So really, you know, speaks to the uh, depth and quality of that relationship that they built up. I, I don't want to say outside of Bluter, but, you know, that was, it's always been sort of a team package when it comes to recruiting. So, yeah, you know, they are, they are bringing back some substantial talent. They've, they've got this uh, recruiting class coming in that is, uh, you know, I'm already blanking on it. I, I, I want to say it's either five or six, uh, players deep, but you know, players that they really, really trust. And uh, I talked to one of them uh, just earlier this afternoon, and uh, she's all in. So uh, we've got a little bit of an update, some some more specifics on that conversation on our premium board uh, for those that want to uh, be following uh, women's basketball recruiting. We're we're going to be ramping up that coverage uh, this off season into the season. So yeah, you know she really wants to stress that competitiveness. I, I think Lucy Olson is a big, big first step uh, in, in, you know, getting Iowa back to competitiveness. And it really doesn't take much of a stretch of imagination to think about Iowa really, at the very least, pushing for that highest echelon in the Big Ten. Like, yeah, there's going to be some tough teams, especially with expansion of the Big Ten. Juju Watkins, I mean, both the UCLA and USC have just absolutely loaded up. But are you going to say unequivocally that uh, I was not going to be able to hang with them with Coach Jay back with essentially the coaching staff back with the, you know, all the expected returnees back? Are you going to tell me that that, you know, Iowa can't possibly beat the Bruins or the Trojans? Because I don't believe that. And uh, I, I don't think anybody in that locker room believes that. So, yeah, I mean the realistic expectations, the sort of, you know, 95% um, uh, confidence rate to, to borrow some statistical terms. Yeah. That has to be lower, but if all you do is just, you know, stay pragmatic and realistic to a fault, you know, maybe basketball and maybe coaching is not really the field for you. So yeah, the, uh, the optimism, the high expectations, the standards of success, are not changing with this transition. Anything else before we move on from, from coach Jay? Yeah, I know, uh, Adam, you know, one of the things you talked about on our last podcast, um, and you also asked, uh, Jensen this today was, you know, who's going to be her Jan Jensen. So, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and, you know, what she said about, you know, filling that, that role on her staff? Yeah, she gave a really thoughtful and, um, you know, she, she had to take a little bit of time to think about it, too. But uh, I thought her answer was uh, thoughtful. It was very uh, complimentary of um, Abby Stamp, who is a, uh, a longtime um, assistant that they've had on the staff. I mean, gosh, most of them are. But, um, you know, Abby was a former player uh, back in the day for the Hawkeyes. So she has this built-in, baked-in, um, you know, passion for this program in particular. Um, Coach Jay really praised her, um, you know, recruiting the uh, sort of basketball IQ um, and really just sort of attention to detail. So if you were going to read some tea leaves, Stamp might be an interesting candidate for an associate head coach or an assistant head coach or or you know, whatever that situation ends up being. And it, it really does sound like uh, not even Jensen has that uh, idea really, you know, in ink. She said that she's still putting together job descriptions and she does have another hire to make too. And, and so if there's going to be somebody who, you know, sort of steps in and is just a knockdown or like knockout, no brainer, future head coach, this is their last step, you know, maybe that candidate X is who you roll with as an assistant slash associate head coach. You know, maybe you go there. Maybe you get somebody who's, you know, sort of brand new 
Uh, maybe it's Kate Martin. If there's some way to figure out a way to balance her WNBA duties and coaching duties. I mean, we, we saw that uh, up in Minnesota with, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name. Um, not um, Lindsay Whalen. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so there are ways to do that, especially since the seasons don't overlap. And so there's there's some decisions to make. And, and we get the sense that, you know, Jensen is in the early stages of uh, evaluating those decisions. So there's really no point in speculating because we don't really know, um, you know, what precisely um, she's looking for. She doesn't even know that yet. But uh, I know that they're excited about the prospect of hiring another coach. I know that they're uh, very excited about the coaches that they have coming back. And, um, you know, it also sort of might be a situation where Jensen already has so much familiarity with those associate head coach responsibilities and duties that she doesn't have as much of a need for one as, say, Lisa Bluter might have. So, Still a fluid situation, but yeah, she she did think quite a bit about, you know, how her roles are changing. How do you, you know, figure out what those holes are going to be and who's going to fill that? Uh, but she really did lean on the familiarity and trust. And again, we're going to use this word again, loyalty that she's got with the rest of the staff. Yeah, and you've got the uh, the video of her full response on your Twitter and also in the the article you wrote about her press conference today. So people can definitely uh, go watch that. It is a, a really good response from her. So Yeah, and, and of course, I'm not going to be able to do her, her, her response justice. So yes, uh, by all means, everyone, uh, go ahead, look for that in the article or on my Twitter at Adam underscore Jacoby. And uh, I think you're going to be um, pleasantly... I don't even want to say surprise. I think you'll be uh, pleased with uh, the quality and depth of Jensen's response. And that link will be in the description for the podcast on, on Apple podcast, Spotify, and uh, YouTube as well. Um, that'll tag right at the top there for, for everybody who's listening, watching. Um, and, and now that we've wrapped up talking a little bit about coach Jay here on, on the podcast, I want to transition to basketball. And before we talk about Iowa's newest addition in the portal, Sadu Treor, again, I it might be Treori. I've heard it pronounced differently on the, the broadcasts from highlights that I've seen. So we will get that fixed fixed or, or corrected at some point in time, um, sooner rather than later. But regarding uh, Peyton Sanford and the NBA Combine, uh, some struggles happening for Peyton. He, he did appear to hurt his shoulder today, ultimately did return to the five on five portion after that with some tape, some athletic tape on his shoulder, but having some trouble in the combine, um, Ross, you have those stats for us on, on how he played between two games in, in five on five portion of, of the combine. Right. Yeah. He's played in two games so far in the five on five action and total of four points, two of nine shooting overall, uh, zero of seven, from three point range and then four rebounds. So, you know, he, he was getting some talk coming into the week as a, you know, a guy to watch. And unfortunately for him, I, I don't think this is the, uh, the performance he was looking for or hoping for um, to build on, on that buzz. This definitely had some struggles in that five on five portion. And then uh, during the, the workout portion prior to the five on five, um, I saw some stats, see if I can pull them up here. Uh, let's see here. Shuttle run 2.84 seconds. Again, I, I don't know what the frick is a good time for that. Pro lane drill. Don't know. But, uh, as far as spot up shooting, he went 16 of 25 shooting off the dribble, 17 of 30, three point star drill, 12, 12 of 25 and side mid side shooting, uh, 19 of 28, which According to Tyler Tashman from the register, who I texted with a little bit back and forth uh, about his performance, those are average numbers. And for a guy whose calling card is shooting, you can't have average numbers. You got to be uh, uh, amongst the, the top of, of the list, especially um, in, in that uh, five on five portion, too. I watched a little bit of it today. Uh, he had some open threes and just missed them. And that might have been product of the shoulder. But uh, I'm going to write a premium co uh, column on that here shortly probably tonight to have that ready for tomorrow morning but you know he did have a lot of buzz going into this weekend 
Uh, Yahoo Sports had him as the number 26 pick in the first round of, of the draft. And I can see your reaction there, Adam. A lot of other mocks had him high in the middle, of, or excuse me, high in the second round. But uh, they said if he plays well and dominates in the five on five, he could find himself at uh, the 26th spot. That did not happen clearly, but they had him mocked to the Wizards. That doesn't appear to be happening. Adam, tell me about your, your thought process when when I told you that that Yahoo Sports uh, mock had him at 26. Well, it it certainly sounded optimistic, and uh, that sort of I don't think Yahoo's next mock is going to have him there. We'll, we'll we'll put it that way. And you know, obviously, Sanford's a better shooter than an 0 for seven performance is going to indicate, right? He has not forgotten how to shoot threes, but. In terms of making a player like that viable, Elliot, like you mentioned, you know, average is really just not really going to cut it. And, you know, you, you if you want to look at a comp for, you know, what success would look like for a guy like Sanford, you know, the, the first name that really comes to mind for me is uh, Duncan Robinson. Or if you want to go back uh, to, you know, somebody who was uh, in, in state or, or a little bit older, uh, Kyle Corbett, you know, those are the guys who, you really want to be emulating and what made them viable NBA players was being absolutely dominant shooting the three. And we know Sanford's better than what his performance would suggest, but at some point you have to be able to show it when it matters the most. And, you know, just doing 12, uh, 12 out of 25 on the uh, star drill, you know, would be great for me. (laughs) Would be great for Owen Freeman. Uh, but no, he is, if Sanford's not shooting at an elite level, which we know he's capable of, he doesn't have a whole lot of other great, you know, assets to fall back on and say, yeah, but he's still great at this. You know, he, he's not 6'9 or 6'10. He, he doesn't have a tremendous vertical. Um, he's He's a pretty surprisingly good rebounder, but, you know, He's a good rebounder against college competition. Is any of that going to translate to the next level? Well, remains to be seen at best. Uh, But at some point, you really have to show this is what I can do at an elite level, at an NBA level, really. And if it's not going to be shooting for Sanford, what else is it going to be? And, you know, that is sort of something that he's probably going to have to take with him uh, you know, into the thought process of whether to stay in the draft or if he comes back to Iowa City, how do I improve on that? How do I make myself better and more NBA ready in the next 12 months if that's the direction that he wants to go? So there are a couple caveats here as well. A um, couple layers to this, if you will. This class, this draft class, is kind of known to not be as strong as it normally is for the NBA draft. So that probably pushes him more towards the first round, though he still should probably be a second rounder. The second thing is he's having private workouts with teams and he could have very well gone to a workout with the Pacers or the Kings or the trailblazers and lit it up. And that could be enough for an NBA team. They've got this Mm -hmm. entire, he's got three years of film from college right like you have a couple bad days at the combine it shouldn't destroy your draft stock right but his performance didn't help it yeah that that's that's the bottom line i think here and again i'll I'll have a a premium column on that um on on peyton and and his decision coming tomorrow um and and again that'll be on iowa.rivals.com but uh probably good to leave it there and and folks can check that article out on uh tomorrow on the site to keep it with men's basketball i will land sadu treor from manhattan he's a six seven transfer averaged let's see here 11.8 points 8.2 rebounds 2.3 assists um his his freshman campaign with the jaspers i think he averaged like one and a half blocks and or 1.3 blocks and one and a half steals per game somewhere around there um so We've got premium content on him as well. And if you are a premium subscriber, you know about this commitment two days ago. So uh, folks, if you're not subscribed to premium content at iowa.rivals.com, you're missing out on on content like that, getting all that information 
way before everybody else. But um, for for Treor, this is again something that we're going to hit briefly because there is premium content on the site. But this is a another to me. This is another probably well another older Chris Tajo. He's two years older than Chris Tajo. He played a year at prep school and then went to Manhattan. So he's got a year post high school and a year um, in, in college under his belt played at the MAAC level, which is definitely low major basketball. Uh, Manhattan was not good, but a huge bright spot for them was, was Treyor scored in double digits against Kansas and Yukon had a 17 rebound game. I think, yeah, it was against Farley Dickinson and he had four blocks in that game too. This is just like, he's, he's not a refined basketball player, right? To me, that's why he came to Iowa because Iowa can do that. They can mold him into what his potential, what his potential is um, for right now. He's pretty raw, but you bring in a guy who can get you 8.2 rebounds per game. That is huge. Granted, again, it is that move from low major to high major basketball, but he's six, seven. That's an improvement defensively and on the glass. And as opposed to a guy like Matt Frost, this isn't a mercenary. This is a guy who has three years of eligibility left. And if he does improve like he potentially could, it might be two years at Iowa, depending on what he does, because that athleticism is there. The ball handling is there. The um, the free throw is there, though his shooting percentage from deep is 25.6%. You don't love to see that, right? But his free throw percentage is 80%. That translates to him growing in that regard. More reps, getting in the gym this summer, that's going to be beneficial. And uh, in that premium article, I talked about whether or not Peyton returns and how much that's going to affect his role in year one. If he doesn't have to be a creator, if he doesn't have to be a shooter, then that's going to be really beneficial for Iowa. If you can really rely on Peyton Sanford to be your best player and Trey Orr can play complimentary basketball. And by the way, two athletes on this team now that were not on the team last year. That is a just in itself a massive upgrade defensively. Their lob threats, like, and Iowa's form of basketball, the way they play basketball is just fun in itself. But when you add athletes to it, then it becomes all the more fun because you can really get out and run. Um, so I, I like this move. I know obviously the staff does too. Um, they think he's going to be really good, but um, I, I, he's on the all rookie team in, in the Metro Atlantic athletic conference last season he's the only player in the league with 300 points 200 rebounds 60 assists 40 steals and 30 blocks um for the season so a lot of different things he can do he's a little bit more mature than a typical sophomore you bring in because he has that year of prep school and he's an athlete man like that's that's the number one thing to me that that they're bringing in here yeah that really jumped out to me watching his highlights was the athleticism, like what he can do on defense, rebounding, uh, the ability to attack the rim um, and, and in transition, like there's, he brings a lot of good skills, I think, to, to this team. Um, and yeah, I think you really hit a key point for him and, and what he can do at Iowa in, in the premium article. So uh, I hope people uh, go and read that and, and subscribe so they can read it as well. Um, but I really think, for next year, the best thing for him would be to not have to be have a major role. Like if he can have a smaller role on the team and actually just get it get adjusted to. I mean, he's going from the Mid Atlantic or uh, Metro Athletic. Is that Metro Mac. Mac. Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference? Yeah, that like Elliot said, low uh, he's going major the- baby, low <laughs> major. He's going from that to the Big Ten, which is a big jump, and I, it's going to be a definite adjustment period. And you know, you've met, you mentioned that Iowa is a good place for guys to refine their skills and uh, develop, and we have plenty of proof of concept of that. And you know, just go back a couple years to the Murray twins, and I'm not saying he's going to be the next you know first round draft pick like they were. That was you know phenomenal development, but they were two guys who. Uh, you know, they came to Iowa their first year on campus. Both of them uh, had a smaller role, uh, and then they developed into much bigger roles, bigger stars. Uh, and we've seen that with other guys too, where you know they kind of have to get their feet wet, get get adjusted to the speed of the Big Ten, the physicality of the Big Ten. 
Uh, but once they do that, and you know, the Fran's staff is excellent at actually, you know, coaching and developing guys. Um, you know, I think I think the what we can see from Traore, uh, not necessarily next year, but the year after that seems really exciting to me. Like I, I I'm definitely looking forward to what he can do next year. I think he'll be an asset for sure. But uh, he, he can be he can go from a complimentary piece next year to potentially a starring piece. I think in uh, 2025 ish. So. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the Murray twins, and and I get that. You know, on some level, you can't really expect any staff or, or even this staff to, to replicate um, that level of success, because, I mean, that that really is a like once in a lifetime development. Uh, but I'll, I'll throw out another name. And in fact, a couple names. Um, Gable Lashaney. That's a guy who came into Iowa as as raw as raw could be. And. Uh, he had the luxury of patience, especially on the roster with, I, I believe he was the same. If, if he was not in the same class as Woodbury, I think he was like one year away at tops. And so he had the opportunity to sort of grow into that role, really refine his uh, technique. And uh, again, that is a, uh, a compliment to this uh, Iowa staff and, and the way that Fran uh, develops these players. And it, it's, it's also not really an unrealistic goal. But, you know, we and, and then the other name that I'll just toss out there is Nelson Basabi, because he was a guy that came that was committed to Fran and uh, was committed in the um, uh, to Siena, which is also a, a Mac school. So and, and, you know, he didn't turn out to be an NBA prospect or, or anything like that, but he didn't need to be. You know, he was a guy that you could plug in at a three or a four. Uh, you know, he was scoring double digit points pretty regularly and, you know, ended up being a, a really solid contributor. So, um, you know, obviously um, Sadu is going to be his own player and, and, you know, there, there's only so much that a player can, you know, follow somebody else's blueprint uh, for development. And, but with all that said, the track record is absolutely there for him to develop into a solid player under Fran and, uh, the fact that he's bringing this high level, really the high ceiling of athleticism, I think is really going to make him stand apart from guys like, and, and I'm not saying this to belittle them, but I think he's, that's going to make him sort of stand apart from a guy like Rebracha or, or um, Ben Cricky or, you know, the guys that you bring in for a year or two because they're solid, but, you know, may not play, you know, above the rim very often. You know, he's a guy that can bring that element to the court and and often if you look at this roster might be the only guy playing above the rim on the court at any given time depending on where those rotations are for the Hawkeyes so yeah a a lot to be excited about here Uh, he is a development project but uh, you can see why the Fran you know Fran and his staff uh, were, were so keen on bringing him into the fold I'll tell you this for as fun as a player like Tony Perkins could be at times for all the cool things Owen Freeman did as a freshman last year, the expectations rise, right. For, for Owen, but to bring in Treore and Tajo in the, the same off season, man, I'm looking forward to, I I'm so much more excited to watch them play than I was the team last year. And again, that's, that's no, not necessarily like a negative thing. It's just different, right? It's more fun. Um, and I, I think, of course you got to tamper expectations because the team is going to be young, especially if Peyton doesn't come back, then it's a little shaky. It will be a rebuilding year, but uh, things, things are going to be fun. I'm excited about Drew Thelwell. I think that that was a really nice ad. I'm excited about Owen Freeman. I'm excited about Josh Dix. Like this team uh, could be could be really fun. I think the the skill sets complement each other well. Um, I, I think uh, having Josh Dix and Peyton Sanford will be integral, and and their ability to shoot is going to be integral to the success because you've got Owen Freeman in the front court. You've got Chris Tajo and, and, and Sato Triore in in the front court. You've got Brock Harding in the back court. You've got Drew Thelwell. Like a lot of these things, it's starting to take shape now. It's just going to be one year with Drew Thelwell, right? Like, and and probably last year Peyton Sanford if he decides to return. So you've got to mold some things, but uh, but it's going to be fun. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. 
Um, anything else on on Treore or or on on the the portal for the men? No, good, cool. Reminder that uh, folks on on our premium board knew about this more than uh, almost two days prior to uh, Treore's public commitment. So if you want to join us there, we'd love to have you. Um, definitely uh, don't want you to miss out on on that content. Now. Uh, another portal addition that took, I think, everybody by surprise, Jacob Gill out of the portal uh, from Northwestern wide receiver. After three years with the Wildcats, he entered the portal and is now going to end up at Iowa. Just 16 catches for 195 yards and two touchdowns in his career with the Wildcats. Um, you could maybe blame some of that on scheme. You could maybe blame some of that on the fact that they brought in some other portal receivers to Northwestern last year, and he was surpassed on the depth chart. But uh, Gill is a depth addition, which is huge. This is another offseason where Iowa brings in a uh, quarterback and a and, uh, skill position player from another Big Ten school. So kind of an interesting trend going on there. But Jacob Gill, uh, the newest Hawkeye uh, Russ, I just wanted to see or hear your initial thoughts on on the ad because I ran it enough about Treore in the last last little bit. So so I'll go to you here first. I mean, I think you nailed it when you said that he's a good depth addition. Like he's not a guy that's going to immediately you know upgrade Iowa's receiving core to an elite level or even you know just a a next level from where they were, but. You know, this was a, a receiving unit that was extremely thin in terms of uh, scholarship bodies and veteran bodies. Like he, he's been around college football for several years now. Uh, so he's got that experience. He, he knows the Big Ten. Like there's no adjustment period there. He's been, uh, you know, at Northwestern for three years. So he's seen everybody in the Big Ten, um, you know, minus our, our new new teams next this coming year. But so on, whatever. Um, so I think that's just some really positive attributes that uh, he brings, like just having that experience, having that veteran status, uh, having that, you know, he, he does, you know, it's just the raw level of talent he brings, you know, those are all things that that wide receiver room needed. Like it was just very bare um, after, you know, Vines and Bostic uh, left uh, this off season into the portal themselves. Um, you know, I, just very thin, you know, I always got some, some freshmen coming in this summer. Uh, they're exciting guys, KJ Parker uh, and, and Reese Vanderzee, but they're freshmen. <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to put too much of a, a weight on them. And I think having a guy like Gill, um, you've got him, you've got Caleb Brown, you've got Seth Anderson. Um, so the, having those guys to hopefully help lead the way for a lot of the younger guys in that receiving room, uh, I, I think is really beneficial. Yeah, one of the things that really sort of jumped out at me was just the experience. And, you know, when we were talking about Brendan Sullivan and his transfer recently, what did we say? That he brought the floor up, if, if you know, especially if Cade McNamara can't go. It's sort of the same situation with Gil. He brings the floor up a little bit, you know, incrementally. But, you know, that is if he can get on the field, those are snaps that would have gone to somebody who was less experienced, who, you know, may have even been a walk on. And, you know, how many games did Iowa fans, you know, sort of suffer through over the last few years? I mean, you, you look at the uh, season opener against South Dakota state, what was it two years ago where they had one healthy scholarship receiver on the field. And so any guy that you can bring in that has that experience that, that knows how to, you know, sort of playing an offense uh, with a functional uh, downfield passing game, that is a benefit that Iowa didn't have uh, prior to Gill's commitment. And yeah, I, I get that some fans were, you know, sort of turning up their nose at the idea of, I, I think somebody said the, uh, the eighth leading receiver for the Wildcats last year. And yeah, I get it. At the same time, Purdue fans could have turned up their noses at Charlie Jones for being Iowa's, what, sixth leading receiver before he transferred over there. And he ended up, you know, having a, um, you know, all American or at the very least all big 10 season made his way to the NFL. So a lot really depends on these guys finding good fits for their skill set, good offenses for them to be a part of. And, 
you know, this is sort of the first year in about a decade where you could say Iowa might have something to offer to wide receivers in, in that, um, you know, respect. Now, obviously, they have to prove it on the field. And, uh, you know, we just look at Raylan Sharp for an example of a guy who's like, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll see you guys. I'm going to Fresno. Uh, so obviously, it's still a lot of work to build there. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is a situation where I was bringing in a guy who has, you know, proven himself at a Big Ten level, if not necessarily a Big Ten star level or an all Big Ten level. But maybe it's a situation where he's going to have uh, an opportunity to, you know, get more consistent snaps, develop that, uh, you know, or not even develop the rapport, lean on the rapport that he's already built up with Brendan Sullivan. If you know Sullivan is the guy who's uh, under center for, you know, extended periods of time next season, which again we can't really rule out. So I mean, yeah, I'm sure IO fans would have liked, you know, Julio Jones 2.0 or or you know, uh, Megatron but taller. I get it. At the end of the day, you sort of need the guys who one want to come to Iowa City, and 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 two, you know, are that good fit in the locker room. Uh, you know, have some level of experience that are going to, you know, bring something to the core that that uh, Iowa doesn't really have already. So it sounds like Gill's a great fit, and you know, regardless of where his production ends up, I think what he's doing is once again elevating the level of talent that Iowa has available at wide receiver. And I'm never going to, you know, recommend that the fans turn up their noses at something like that. What did I say when they brought in Brendan Sullivan? Beggars can't be choosers. That is the bottom line here at quarterback and at receiver. You cannot, once you add a power five receiver to this article, you or to this article, to this group, to this receiving poor, prior to that saying, oh, they only have five scholarship receivers. What are they doing? And then they bring in a guy. You cannot <laughs> come to me on our board or on Twitter and complain when they do add somebody. That is not how this works. Beggars cannot be choosers. I said that on our board today when some folks were, were complaining and I underlined it because that's how I feel. I don't know how many times I heard that phrase from my parents growing up, and now it makes all the sense in the world. Um, but this is a, a an addition where you bring in experience, where you bring in a guy with Big Ten uh, experience specifically. Like you guys said, he looks like a speedster. He has a rapport with with Brendan Sullivan. Like you 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 make it happen when you have this opportunity in front of you, right? Because what some folks have said. Uh, on Twitter, which is kind of true. I mean, folks go to Iowa or players go to Iowa on offense to see their careers die. <laughs> like <laughs> that's a little hyperbolic, right? But like, go back to all these players that Iowa has brought in out of high school that were pretty reputable, pretty good receivers. Uh, Quavon Matthews transferred. Charlie Jones, who was a transfer, transferred. Um, Oh gosh, uh, uh, Arlen Bruce transfer, Keegan Johnson transfer, um, Desmond Tyrone. Hudson transfer. What Tyrone as Tyrone Tracy, Tyrone Tracy transfer, like, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And the only one who didn't transfer or go to play baseball is Nico Ragaini. And Nico Ragaini, for as long as he stuck around Iowa, did I don't think he was really that impactful on winning football games in Iowa City. All the respect in the world to Nico Ragini, but he was impactful for one for the okay, Penn State. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. but for but one. you said games <laughs> plural. You said games <laughs> plural, so that you're you're still right. Touche. <laughs> now, with that, I, I the thing that sticks out to me here, and I, I'll probably write, I might write something about this. I I, I don't know. I'm not not positive, but. Clearly, Iowa wanted to bring in another slot receiver when a lot of people were talking about X because they went after Raylan Sharp first, and now they bring in Jacob Gill, which is just kind of interesting to me. To, to me, it appeared that you had that in the room. You had Caleb Brown. You had uh, uh, TJ Washington. You had Caden Weijin, though Caden Weijin isn't necessarily going to play the slot. It just kind of appeared that they had that. Maybe they believe more so in in in. Um, in Dayton Howard and Jerry at Bowie than, than maybe we do, but 
that was just an interesting tidbit that I just thought of. So I, I, I find that interesting. I, I don't know what their prerogative was there. I think they're probably set in terms of kick return, punt return. So you're not going to necessarily need to look to Gill to do that. But again, this is a guy who you see as a, a, a player that can, at the very least, you know, raise the floor, like you said, Adam. And that's what you need on the Iowa offense right now. That is what you need. So. Yeah, I think, you know, what the offense is looking for, you need a proof of concept if you're going to attract the better, you know, recruits, especially at receiver and quarterback. Like, they need to see, okay, I can succeed at Iowa. I can put up numbers there. And so you, you need guys that are willing right now to take that chance and come to Iowa and, you know, hopefully under – Tim Lester, they can actually do something that, you know, hey, there, there's something happening here. I, I can come to Iowa. I can actually, you know, do stuff in a passing game. And, you know, if, if that happens, then, yeah, maybe I was able to get in the conversation on some bigger name, you know, receivers or quarterbacks in the future if if it comes to it. But right now they just need guys that are willing to, to take that chance <laughs> on the Iowa offense right now. So, uh, and Gil is. So, you know, We'll see what we can do. The other thing I'll, I'll say about that slot position and them going after a player like that, I think that might be indicative as to what Tim Lester wants for his offense position res- or sorry, uh, possession receivers, get him the ball in space, let him make a play. And, and Gil has that, that type of speed and that type of playmaking ability. So uh, anything else guys, before we get out of here and let Adam drive home and not spend the night in his car. Uh, what, one thing, actually, that, that I'll add on that front, and this is completely off topic, but uh, I am, um, for, for those who are watching on YouTube, you see me in my car, I, I'm parked in a gravel lot in uh, Le Grand. If I'm going to assume that's how they pronounce it, although with Iowa town names, you never know. But let, let's say it's Le Grand. And uh, one, uh, shout out to the Phillips 66 for letting me park here. But also, two, um, it's it's funny because, you know, Le Grand or, or Le Grand, if you want to be French about it is, is French for the big. And so like, there's this little uh, laundromat uh, right across the street, but it's Le Grand uh, laundromat. So, so it looks like it's like unintentionally French, like welcome to Le Grand laundromat. And, and of course it's this like 100 square foot, like <laughs> the tiniest laundromat you've ever seen. So uh, I, I'm going to enjoy my time in this uh, little French villa. And uh, and then make my way back to uh, Des Moines. And uh, but yeah, I just wanted to uh, share something that had been making me laugh. That's it. Completely off topic. This episode of Hotcast brought to you by Legrand Laundromat. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and uh, shout out to all our listeners in Legrand. I, I know everybody in that town listens to Hotcast, so we appreciate. I, I was that. greeted like a king. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Hotcast. If you're watching, listening on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe. Smash that subscribe button. Smash that like button. Drop a comment. Let us know what you're thinking about. Coach Jay, Peyton Sanford, head to the NBA. Of course, the portal additions for the men's basketball squad and the football team. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, you might be listening but not subscribed. So make sure you do that today so you don't miss an episode. And if you are a regular listener on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please leave that rate and review. Helps us out a lot. And of course, it does make us very happy. Once again, folks, my name is Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by publisher Adam Jacoby and managing editor Ross Binder here on this episode of Hotcast. And for now, we will see you next time.